I am a third year graduate student at University of Florida. Uh, my advisor is Deshka Narayanan. Um, and I've been working on ground truthing SED fitting methods with cosmological simulations. Um, and I've had a lot of fun with this project and a massive amount of help from Joel Lija and Ben Johnson, um, who are from Charlie Conroy's group. Although Joel Lija is now at Penn State, um, good for him. <laughs> and uh, Rumil Dave, um, head of the Simba cosmological simulation team. Um, and also lots and lots of help um, from Kartik and um, Eric who are on this call. So thank you for that. Um, so this being a Candles SED talk series, what better way than to show, <laughs> you know, the, the um, plot um, for SED fitting. So we're all extremely familiar with this. When we do SED fitting, um, we have assumptions that we make about things regarding stellar evolution and regarding galaxy evolution. Um, and when I usually give this talk, I say, well, you know, we just kind of throw, I'm not really going to consider the stellar evolution part because that's too hard. But the truth of the matter is, is that um, stellar evolution being hard, there's there's lots and lots of uncertainties, especially at for, for rare stellar um, phases because of the short lifetimes and also things that are drastically different from solar. Um, I don't pay attention. Not that I don't pay attention, but um, there's lots of areas of uncertainty especially for stellar mass star formation rate um, with, with, these, with these processes. Um, but I'll get to the real reason why I'm not considering stellar evolution in this study uh, in a bit. Um, so my focus has been on the uncertainties that are propagated through assumptions to do with the star formation history and dust attenuation, things to do with galaxy evolution. Um, and so an interesting thing I like to bring up is um, stellar mass is so fundamental to galaxy evolution. So I'm throwing up a couple um, scaling relations here. We've got the star forming main sequence, um, galaxy stellar mass function. Um, and the important thing to know is that for many of these scaling relations, um, evolution happens at about a fact level, uh, factor of two level. So for instance, for the, um, stellar mass st stellar metallicity relation, there um, is an evolution uh, at a fixed mass, you know, galaxies evolve by a factor of two from redshift two to present day. Um, and so when we consider this fact that also the stellar masses inferred from SED fitting tend to have uncertainties at the factor of two level. And so it's a bit hard to reconcile these, these scaling relations in their evolution when these quantities are also themselves uncertain at a factor of two level. Um, and so what I've been really interested in, what I've been working on is understanding maybe how we can get these uncertainties smaller, but also just understanding where these uncertainties come from. And so a big portion of the uncertainty budget for um, stellar masses from SCD fitting is the assumed star formation history. So I'm showing two contrasting pictures of how to model a star formation history here. So on the left is what I call a non-parametric star formation history. Um, and so this is actually an example from Joel Lija implemented in Prospector, which is uh, a star formation history that is comprised of multiple bins of constant star formation rate. And this is contrasted on the right with a more typical parametric form, uh, which is the delayed tau form. So you have star formation peaking at some time and then declining exponentially thereafter. Um, and I should make a note here that whenever I say non-parametric star formation history, I mean any star formation history that, is, that does not have um, an explicitly assumed functional form. Whereas- What are the shadings on this? On these graphs? Yeah, so this is, um, I think the color bar got cut off. This is a PDF of um, essentially draws from the prior for both models. Um, and so um, my project thus far has been 
essentially asking the question, how well can we measure the stellar mass of the galaxy? Um, so there's essentially two ingredients to this. One is looking at how the star formation impacts our, our estimates for the stellar mass. And then the second part is providing a test bed to answer that question. Um, and so we do this by using cosmological simulations. So this is kind of a complicated picture, but essentially I'm walking you through that. We have um, thousands of galaxies from a cosmological simulation. We forward model to get an observed broadband SED. And then we take that broadband SED and put that through Prospector um, SED modeling. So essentially acting like an observer, choosing models for things like star formation history, metallicity, dust, etc. And essentially seeing how well the inferred properties um, are reproduced if, if, if we can match the true properties of these galaxies. And then of course, the first half is to focus on the impact of the star formation history model. So how well can we measure the stellar mass of a galaxy considering the impact of the star formation history alone? So this is the key figure um, from this work. This is showing um, on the x-axis, the true stellar mass and on the y-axis, the inferred stellar mass. And the contours and colors refer to the different star formation history models. So the orange dots are the non-parametric, and then the contours are the delayed tau with the first component, the delayed tau without the first component, and a constant. So the delayed tau family, and really any exponential family of star formation histories are pretty typical. Um, so I do regret a little bit that in this work, I did not consider, I suppose, more complex star formation parametric forms, um, such as log normal, or maybe delay tau with a linear, um, uh, linear portion um, towards, towards recent look back times. Um, but for the most part, we see that as we add more complexity, such as with the burst component, our stellar masses essentially converge to some systematic underestimate. So the scatter, it's a little bit hard, but between the dark blue and the light blue, our scatter does um, improve a bit, but our overall offset, our overall bias does not improve. Um, and really that isn't too surprising. It's found that these simple parametric forms do impose biases on our, our inferred stellar masses. Um, so this is showing that bias here, just the inferred stellar, or the, sorry, the, I think this is backwards, the inferred stellar mass minus the um, true stellar mass. Um, and so we see that the parametric forms tend to underestimate the stellar masses for these galaxies. But even more than that, um, these biases are imposed along with prior, or excuse me, um, uncertainties that are underestimated. So this plot is showing uh, the fraction of galaxies that essentially have error bars that cover the true stellar mass. Um, so we would hope that if a galaxy stellar mass was underestimated or overestimated by some amount, the error bars would be large enough to compensate for that bias. But we see that roughly 20% of galaxies, only 20% of galaxies fit with a tau star formation history have error bars that track this bias. Whereas for a majority of galaxies fit the non-parametric, um, the error bars do cover the true stellar mass within one sigma. Can I um, uh, ask now about what you mean by non-parametric? Um... Yeah. So. <laughs> Non-parametric, my definition, and the definitions do differ. I'm sure Kartik and Eric have different definitions. So my definition is um, a model that does not impose, a model that doesn't explicitly assume a shape. So the delayed tau star formation history um, explicitly assumes a declining exponential um, in time. The non-parametric model does not have 
a does not explicitly assume a functional form. Instead, um, the priors that are assumed for this model fit for the fractional masses formed within each time bin. So, so it's a bit of a misnomer yeah, in this case level, because there are parameters. Right. So the, the, the parameters are like the bin centers and sizes. And exactly. then you don't impose any any restriction on covariance or anything between the adjacent bins. So they're allowed to go all over the place. Well, so that's where um, the flexibility comes in because you can. So for instance, there's a prior that um, imposes continuity between adjacent bins within some small number. Um, but there, yeah, there are priors that are a bit more flexible. So you do get the fluctuation so essentially, you can model um, star formation histories to be bursty versus not bursty. So the particular prior I chose here did allow for some discontinuities between adjacent time bins. There was that burstiness, if you will, allowed. Um, my definition of not parametric is simply just to contrast with parametric Sure. in that there is no functional form essentially it's it's there's no predefined shape right yeah, yeah. so i mean I, I i wasn't trying to be argumentative it's just oh no when you you know when you think of the whole issue here as a compression problem when you're you know with just a simple tau model you're compressing your entire data down to you know, two two numbers, right? And here you're compressing down, but it's a larger num set of numbers. Um, and so, yeah, the stellar mass is one number that you get out of that compression <laughs> because you've now compressed it down to the one one number, but you've done via some intermediate compression that might have lost information. Right. Yeah. Um, so with uh, there's a plot in here somewhere, but I did do tests fitting galaxies with um, a number of time bins ranging from three, which is essentially the number of parameters allowed in the delayed tau model, all the way up to 12, I believe. Um, and there was, if you squinted your eyes, there was essentially no difference in the um, estimated stellar masses uh, when using time, you know, the any number of time bins. Um, and so you could, one could argue, and one has argued that the, the, the non-parametric, it's not a very fair game to play, um, putting the non-parametric against the parametric because of the sheer intrinsic flexibility in the non-parametric model. But if you restrict yourself to the same number of parameters that are typically in the parametric model, it's it, the, the, the stellar masses you get are much better still. Yeah. And on that note, um, Kartik's um, Gaussian process star formation history model uh, actually determines the, the um, optimal number of parameters to describe the star formation history. So it's a bit probably more pure, purely non-parametric. So it actually determines the number of parameters from data. Um, but yeah. All right. Uh, I had one quick question before you go ahead, Sydney. Yeah. So all of these masses and quantities that you're showing, are these uh, fitting the, the pure noiseless SEDs that come from the forward modeling? Like, yeah. You, you add noise before fitting them or? As no. As yeah. So. The SEDs, I, I don't think I have a picture of that, but the SEDs that I get from the forward modeling, they're noiseless. I do mm -hmm. apply a photometric uncertainty, but it's 3%, so it might as well not be there. Um, and this was done because I really just wanted to focus on the impact of the star formation history. Mm -hmm. um, so purely, if everything else was correct, oh, and actually thank you for bringing this up because um, I did wanna talk about the stellar models so we are actually able to match the stellar evolution models between the forward and backwards modeling. So these 
quantities that I'm reporting here are in the absence that we are getting the IMF, isochrones, et cetera, wrong. Okay. Um, so, right, yeah, noiseless SCB. So essentially, <laughs> in a perfect world, you know, wh what do our stellar masses look like? Right. And does it take the, the spatial distribution of anything in the galaxy into account while doing the, while generating the forward model SCB? Like, is the spatial distribution of dust something that gets taken into account when? Yeah. Doing? Yeah. So for um, in Hyperion, it does take. So it's a little bit complicated because it's based on simulation. Mm -hmm. um, but for Simba, which is a simulation I use, we do have, we do model dust um, and how it evolves, and so we do use that dust distribution. And actually do the intrinsic 3D dust ready to transfer to generate okay. that. Awesome. Um, but I, and I and I'll talk about that in a bit too, and how that relates to the work I'm doing currently. But great question, yeah. Oops. Um, all right. So this is um, also looking at the stellar uh, ages and the star formation rate. Um, and so uh, something I want to highlight here is the fact that even though um, you look at this plot and say, OK, well, there's just some systematic offset that the parametric model is imposing, perhaps we can correct for that. And I say to that, well, OK, you can correct for the stellar masses, but your ages and star formation rates are going to be off as well. Um, and so essentially, the the parametric models cannot simultaneously infer the stellar mass, stellar age, and star formation rate, um, as well as the non-parametric. Um, so there are still issues. It does look like we are systematically um, underestimating the stellar age. And we do have um, a bimodal distribution where uh, a pretty big chunk of galaxies have also an underestimated star formation rate. But um, I suppose by I, I would call this, we did a bit better <laughs> than the parametric. Um, and then of course, looking at these star formation histories. So um, in the black is the true galaxy star formation rate calculated from um, the simulation. And then the blue is again, the delay tau, the orange is the non-parametric. So the solid lines are the median, um, and the shaded region is the one sigma region. So something that strikes me here is um, how uncertainties in the star formation history tend not to, for the parametric model at least, tend not to translate to uncertainties um, in the stellar mass. So something I saw by eye just by seeing a bunch of these uh, star formation histories from the parametric model is uh, the star formation histories that are it, it reports back, um, the uncertainties are huge. It essentially covers all of parameter space. And so I just, I thought that was very interesting how unuseful these star formation histories are. Um, but a striking thing um, is how, how essentially S the SED modeling as a whole struggles to recover the star formation at early times. Um, so I call these star formation bursts, but I'm not sure if that's the correct term because it's essentially just elevated star formation over, over um, uh, a large interval of time at early times. Um, so again, shout out to Kartik, who has already um, stated this, that um, one can essentially not, it's incredibly difficult to recover the early star formation um, because all evidence of that star formation is lost in the SED. Um, because, you know, the, the, the bright stars that would dominate that light at that time have already died out. And so when you are modeling early star formation rate, the early star formation history, you are dominated by the prior of your star formation history model. So we see that here in these two plots um, where the gray is the intrinsic um, Simba early star, specific star formation rate 
distribution. The thin lines are, um, I think, 200 random galaxy posteriors for early specific star formation rate. And then the thicker lines are the um, prior on this quantity. Um, so it's very striking that, yes, we are, for the most part, prior dominated because these these posteriors do tend to follow the prior. Um, so something I've kind of swept on, under the rug up until now is that um, the results I've shown you have essentially been in the absence of any confusion or degeneracy with dust. And that's because in the SED model, I fixed the attenuation to match the forward model. So these quantities have actually been um, uncertainties in the absence of dust attenuation. Um, and we know that that has to play an important part in SED modeling. Um, so this plot I'm showing here um, is what happens when we include uh, a variable dust attenuation model. So the red orange is the non-parametric and the blues are the parametric, the delay tau. Um, so something surprising here is that the non-parametric is hand wavy, not too influenced, not too impacted by the inclusion of a variable dust attenuation model. The parametric certainly is. Um, and so my current work has been understanding this in, in detail. Um, so these are all extremely preliminary um, current work going on and also trying to figure out how to show this information. Um, so one thing we've noticed is, like this plot alludes, is that the um, for the non-parametric star formation history model, the, the stellar masses are not um, impacted as much by the choice of attenuation model. So what this plot is showing, the um, ignore the legend for now, but the orange and green are the same star formation history model. The reddish pink is still a non-parametric star formation history model, but a different prior. The solid versus dotted is a different attenuation curve. So we see that our stellar masses are dominated by the assumption for our star formation history model. Um, and maybe that's not too surprising. So we are instead not, we are, we are essentially taking our focus away from the simple question of how well can we infer stellar masses and looking at essentially all galaxy properties um, in aggregate and asking the question, essentially asking the reverse question, which is what, how important is getting the dust attenuation correct? Um, so this is a plot showing um, the columns are the uh, dust attenuation models, very common dust attenuation models. So Creek and Conroy 2013, and then the right hand column is a Calzetti model. And so this is showing for the Simba galaxies, uh, inferred attenuation curve minus the true attenuation curve normalized in the V band. Um, so we see that the Calzetti curve with the fixed slope um, is just not, not recovering the curves as well as the Creek and Conroy. The, the different rows refer to the different star formation history models, but like I showed earlier, um, um, these don't matter too much. Um, so you can essentially just look at the top row. So the Creek and Conroy does a pretty good job, but there are still some um, outliers um, in this plot showing here, star formation rates, on the um, true star formation rate on the x-axis, on the y-axis inferred for two different attenuation curve models. And there's not a huge difference, even though there's a big difference in the inferred um, attenuation curve offset. Just a, a question on um, what we're looking at in that previous plot. So um, you're fitting, um, the, the models that you're fitting were use, using something closer to the dust model of Creek and Conroy as input, right? So the fact that it fits better is sort of expected. Um, oh, so um, this time the, uh, 
so from the so backwards modeling uh, with the input SCDs, um, these the attenuation curve is variable. And so a priori, we didn't really know which model would work best. The way maybe be easier to explain um, the first portion. So in the first portion, what actually happened was um, both the forward model and the backward model were a screen model. So the SCD that we got from the radiative transfer could exactly be matched by the attenuation curve assumed in the forward model. Now we take the true dust distribution from the galaxies, the actual um, dust radiative transfer. Um, but now in the backward model, um, we are just taking two curves of the literature. So it wasn't clear from the start which curve would fit the best. Um, so is Creek and Conroy just applied as a, as a screen, like sort of like Calzetti, but with a different shape? Right, okay. yeah. So in, in the SED modeling, um, the attenuation curves are applied as a screen. So all stars see the same um, attenuation, optical depth. And, and is that curve in some sense flatter than Calzetti then? I mean, less UV for the same AV or is it? Right, so uh, this plot here um, in oh, the actually, left. Actually yeah, so green is Calzetti. Uh, oh, and yeah. these are with the default, um, these are with some default parameters, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. And so hoping to move away from a dust screen and I suppose more broadly um, trying to ask the question, how can we improve upon modeling the dust galaxy dust attenuation? Um, we have considered a handful of priors that could be implemented in SED fitting. So one idea is trying to move away from a dust screen model where essentially you have all of the stars in a galaxy, you're ignoring the geometry, uh, how that how the stars couple with dust. And so you are assuming that these stars just see a uniform dust screen and that that uniform dust screen is the same for all stars. Um, so we asked the question is, broadly, is that true for galaxies in the Simba simulation? And the answer is no, but with an asterisk. Um, so this plot is showing us here, um, essentially the fraction of stars that see no dust along line of sight. So this is just for one inclination. Um, and the asterisk comes from what you define no dust in terms of the optical depth that these stars see. Um, and so if you say literally no dust, I want an optical depth of zero. Um, then of course, there are very, very little stars, very small fraction of stars that um, see um, no dust. Um, but if you relax that constraint a little bit and choose maybe 10 to the minus six or 10 minus five for, this is V-band uh, optical depth, um, there are an appreciable number of stars that do see, um, that are unobscured. Um, and so that's going to, that is a significant departure from the, the assumption of a screen model. Um, and so I implemented this uh, as a prior in, in, SC, in, in the SCD model. So I ran these fits again, um, this time just using the Creek and Conroy model. So we see that there is some slight improvement. Um, this is a CDF showing the the, the offset and V-band attenuation. Um, and so we see that adding this extra flexibility where we say, okay, um, we are not strictly imposing a screen model. We do get um, improvements in our V-band optical depth um, estimates. Unfortunately, we actually decrease our accuracy in the inferred star formation rates. And so this was a little bit troubling that 
we added more flexibility and actually got worse answers um, for the star formation rate. It's a little hard to see in the scatter plot, so I included the CDF. Um, but this was this was very troubling. But I think this comes down to the fact, similar to um, early star formation rate, in that including this extra flexibility uh, in in the attenuation curve actually introduces a huge degeneracy um, in these fits. And so what we're seeing here is uh, the gray is the true fraction, or sorry, the true distribution of unobscured stars. Um, I believe with the definition of deviant optical depth of 10 to the minus six. And then with uh, the prior that was implemented in black in the SED model, and then poles, uh, I think it's 200 random galaxies, their posteriors for this, this parameter. And so we see that for the most part, this parameter is is um, very uncertain, um, in in that it, it vaguely tracks the the prior, um, and so I took this as okay. We cannot just simply throw this extra free parameter into this SED model because it is just so degenerate with especially the normalization of the um, attenuation curve? Is it that you have a very high optical depth or is it that all of your stars are obscured? Um, and so it's very hard for the SED model. Well, it isn't very hard because essentially every solution works. Um, it is, it, it, it increases the uncertainty of our, of our parameters, our estimates. Um, oh, and these are corner plots vaguely showing this. Um, on the right is if, um, just the vanilla Creek and Connery curve all, uh, screen model. And then on the left is including that fraction of no dust. Um, and what I want to take away from this is that the uncertainties on these parameter estimates just increase a lot, uh, um, especially for um, like the, the slope of the attenuation curve, huge error bars on that. Um, and so then um, another prior we considered was the correlation between the attenuation curve slope and the V-band optical depth. Um, so this has been seen in observations. Um, so I chose um, uh, from the literature, this is by uh, Celine 2018, the GALAX SDSS and WISE Legacy Survey 2. Um, and there is a correlation between the slope of the attenuation curve and the normalization in the V-band. And so we thought this could be a smart way to um, maybe work around the degeneracies that would occur between, say, the fraction of stars that see no dust and uh, the overall normalization of the curve. Um, so running again an SE model with this, um, just this uh, prior put in, so we're not considering the fraction of um, unobscured stars yet. We do see a big improvement from this um, recovering this um, um, correlation uh, for this in the galaxy. So before, we really struggled to match what this distribution looked like in Simba. Um, and now we are getting a bit better there. Um, we do tend to track the prior itself more than the actual intrinsic Simba distribution. And I believe that has to do with the fact that a lot of our Simba galaxies at redshift zero have very, very small um, V-band optical depths and then very wild slopes. Um, so I'm, I'm still taking a look into that. Um, and But the happy thing is, is that we actually got better um, in our star formation rate um, estimates. So we improved a bit in, in optical depth and also star formation rate. So that was a good sign. Um, oh, and this was putting it all together essentially where I found that this um, prior on the V-band optical depth and the slope, tying the slope to the optical depth worked. So I added back in this fraction of unobscured stars. And again, we see even more improvements. Um, in, in our star formation rate, and then also in our AV delta plot. Um, 
So that is essentially what my current work is right now. So understanding dust, um, how we can do things better. Um, but hopefully we'd like to summarize. So in the beginning, I showed that um, our, our galaxy physical properties can be much better, much more accurately inferred with the use of non-parametric star formation histories. Um, and though the stellar mass is, is largely impacted by the star formation history, other galaxy properties are equally dominated by uncertainties in the dust attenuation. So um, that is what I'm currently working on. So thank you. This was great. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, it, it's, it's hard to do applause on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, all right, so let's open the floor to questions. Is there anything people would like to ask? Eric's got his hand up and then I'm, I'll put my hand up too. Okay, perfect. Uh, Eric, do you want to go first? So Sydney, this is outstanding work and I think you know I'm a big fan of it. One thing I'd like to discuss while we've got you on the line is sort of a small group is whether there might be a better definition to use. You know how I think about this. I think the models of star formation histories you're using are really good and flexible. Mm -hmm. And I think if you use the word flexible instead of non-parametric, it would be accurate and would come along with just as much benefit in terms of convincing people that they're really doing a good job. I appreciate yeah. you defining the definition you're using, but a better definition non-parametric is the one that appears right on Wikipedia that I just added a link to. And the key point there is that to be non-parametric, the definition I would advocate is following this one, that the model adjusts to the quality of the data and has more parameters when the data quality is higher. Now, I think Prospector can do that, but I don't think in this particular paper you're running into that mode, you've got the time start and end of all the bins fixed, and you've chosen a number of bins after some kind of nice pretest. I think that's great, and sometimes the data won't call for more than that but I still think that would be a better definition in terms of clarity for the community. Yeah, I agree. Um, I, so essentially my, my vocabulary of that comes from the fact that Prospector itself calls it non-parametric. I, I'm all for giving a more intuitive name for it, I suppose. Um, but I don't think it would be me who who changes the name in Prospector? I think that's the FSPS is already a co-opted flexible, so you might be <laughs> layering flexible with two different <laughs> anyway. Adaptive? I don't know. I, I guess adaptive. Yeah. yeah, flexible all the way down. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, the one other thing to say about this, I, we're not really arguing, so this is not meant to be argumentative. But well, I I've th I've thought about you know, the next time we have to iterate with Joel about this in the conference, a constant star formation history is parametric. It says there's a start time and end time and a value. Well, you can keep adding bins to that, it stays parametric. It may be more flexible than a particular kind of smooth curve, but right. when the bin number is fixed and the start and end times are fixed, it's just a different functional form. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's why I trip a little bit when I am tr trying to explain what I mean by non-parametric because there, you're right, there is a functional form. Um, and so th that's why I contrast it with, well, it's not as, um, it's not as constrained as say a, a delayed tau. And so I think you're right that truly isn't parametric and there's gotta be a better way to describe it, yeah. Yeah, I wonder something barring from like non-informative priors to the idea that this bin shape doesn't assume where a peak would be, that it'd be halfway back to the Big Bang. There, there are definite advantages yeah. to it. And, you know, yeah. I, as I said, I'm a big fan of the work you're doing and I really appreciate the talk. Yeah, no, I mean, I am a massive fan of the work that Kartik and, and you have done. Um, um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I... I don't mind arguing about <laughs> star formation histories all day. I could, you know, I like doing that. Um, so I have, um, I was thinking about priors a little bit as you were talking and, and uh, the, 
experiments with simulations where you know the inputs are really great for trying to figure out what, what might work and what might not. So um, two sort of thoughts along that line. One is that um, if, and I don't know what you're doing for, as far as assumptions go, but that every galaxy has an age metallicity relation. Now it may be infinitesimally narrow at fixed age, or it may be broad at fixed age, but there is a relation with some, um, you know, it, it actually, if you think about a closed box model, it's an infinitesimally thin line with a functional form that you can write down analytically, right? And of course, model galaxies are not closed boxes, but you have the information in the simulations to see what paths galaxies take through the age metallicity relation and see whether you can impose that as a prior in a way that doesn't over constrain you, but would narrow down your degeneracies by giving you sort of reasonable physical assumptions. And you could in principle do the same for let's say a dust age relation, at least at you know the observed epoch where the older stars might see less dust, they might see a different attenuation curve or whatever, but that you've got that information in your simulation. So you could impose that as a prior on your, on your models. Yeah, definitely. So um, right now in these fits, there is a prior set for the mass metallicity relations, so that's stellar mass, stellar metallicity. Um, and we have seen that. Oh, wait, so um, it's stellar mass, I mean, meaning you're fitting single metallicity models, but they're higher metallicity. I mean, are all, I don't understand how you impose it, I guess. I would have thought um, it was metallicity, not a, a mass metallicity. Yeah, so it's, um, it's total stellar mass. It's it's galaxy. And then you um, fit you, all your stars are all the same metallicity in that galaxy, regardless of age. right. Okay. Yeah, and so that that constraint comes from FSPS. In that, well, no, I take that back. That constraint comes from how FSPS is implemented in Prospect, where we assume essentially a uniform metallicity for all time for all stars yeah of course that's not yeah reality. So that, for high redshift galaxies or whatever that's probably fine for as you get down to low redshift i don't know that could be pretty important i mean if you think about you know resolved studies of like m31 mm -hmm. it, it turns out that the the main sequence is like almost entirely degenerate because the the younger population overlaps the older population, almost right. countering the change in the turnoff with age with a counteracting change in turnoff with metallicity. And um, until you have the giant branch information, you, you can't decouple those. And so in, you know, in integrated SEDs, you're gonna have the same effect, but you can't decouple it unless you've got a metallicity age relation. And, and and that's the issue. We've actually run into that before. Um, because missing the metallicity information. Um, I mean, we've done little toy tests where we've taken, you give, for instance, give FSPS or the true star formation history, the true dust, the true, et cetera. And you get an SED back that is just not is not what the simulation says. And it's because we are missing that chemical evolution. We are missing that metallicity. Um, whether or not, I mean, if, if we do put a smart prior in, um, I think we could fit for that. But I think what's also held me back is being able to um, constrain that, that metallicity evolution with just broadband photometry. Yeah, I mean, that's why I think it'd be really interesting to see whether you actually have the leverage, given yeah. that there's not like an infinite number of possibilities in the galaxies in the simulation. Right? So it may be a small enough parameter space that you don't have to add a lot of parameters. That's true, right. 
and it's also an interesting question right in the sense that if there is a really noticeable change in the difference between simba and like fsps with a constant metallicity when you forward model the sads so like if if there is a big difference between how the the two sads look then that means there is information there that you can use right yeah so recover some information about the metallicity evolution that's very true yeah um and also in all of this we i haven't considered um nebular emission either um so obviously applying this to real galaxies um not only is there uncertainties with stellar evolution but also with with nebular emission as well so and continuum and um uh, emission line so, so it's in, also in another route plots, right so in in all of the plots so far like it doesn't account for uh, emission lines right no no um okay and part of that is because it was a little bit outside the scope but also because we are actively developing our um nebular mission line model in powder day i see so <laughs> it was also out of convenience because um we just simply didn't have the data mm-hmm. right um but prospector is able to model that right um, yeah um Charlotte, I saw that you had your hand up a while back. Yeah, I did. Um, I have just a really quick question. I'm, this is really cool, by the way. This is, I, I love this. Um, this is really beautiful work. Uh, you, did, you. You, you showed a, a slide earlier where um, one of the figures had uh, the star formation history not being able to catch like, you know, a, a, a kind of a elevated star formation history. And, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it's, I'm actually, I'm interested in the one that's on the left because it kind of looks like um, there's a really early time bin that is overestimating the actual star formation history. Am I, I interpreting that correctly? Yeah. So on the left hand, yeah. So yeah. The, that the model is overestimating. Is that common? I'm just, I'm curious for nefarious reasons of my own because it's something that I've seen <laughs> um, um, not with this code, but just in, in general, I have, I have seen it and yeah. Um, so this goes back to what prospector, sorry, what the, the prior on the star formation history model um, is for specific star formation rate. And so um, the prior on the specific star formation rate for this particular model is, I think it's log, um, minus 10.1. Mm-hmm. Um, so if I think if I were to plot this in a smarter way, we would see that, um, essentially all of these star formation rates for maybe the first three time bins, to be honest, mm-hmm. are all dominated by that prior. Okay. Um, because and so- old. Yeah, it's just a so then it's just well, are we overestimating or underestimating for this galaxy? Yeah, yeah, but since um, it's over the it, over several time bins, and they're all kind of covering with one another in that same yeah. room, then you just really can't differentiate it from the from the prior. Yeah, oh, yeah, that totally makes sense. Um, and and it's not a it's not an issue with this model or prospector or it's it's just a simple fact that there is no information in the SED to untangle that early star formation. Yeah. Um, I I had a related question that I wanted to jump in on, which was that like, this might be just the way the continuity model is implemented in prospector, but it really surprises to me surprises me to see that as you go back in time the uncertainties on star formation rate don't get bigger as there's less information. Yeah. Because, I mean, if you are prior dominated then and, and it is still so tight, then it sort of tells me that it's a really, like, it's a tight prior that you're imposing on the fits. So this is with the Dirichlet model. Mm-hmm. Um, and so this, I don't think I have, Um, Actually, no, I do, I lie. I do have, yeah. 
So this is the actual prior um, specific star formation rate averaged over 100 million years and age. Right. Um, so it is tight. Yeah. Yeah. But um, it's also not as tight, I, I think, as the continuity model, right? Which does, mm -hmm. it, it's also, the Dirichlet is funny because um, there's an auxiliary parameter that you, <laughs> that you have to declare, which um, sets the weight of the mass distributed in time bins. And so right. high That's concentration, yeah. yeah. So whether or not mass is formed more uniformly or more mass is formed in certain one or two time bins and then right. everything else. Yeah. So my, my question is basically given that the prior is tight and you're basically using this prior, like your choice of prior essentially ends up setting how much old stellar mass is formed in, in the galaxies that you're fitting. And because of that, it changes the, the, the results. So with Simba, you're able to like ground truth this and, and if like, if, if, how do I phrase this? If the universe is like Simba, then you're reasonably certain that the masses that you're getting are going to be accurate. And therefore all the science that you do, like the mass functions, the separate start correlation, all of those things uh, will also be accurate. But then if there's any divergence from that, uh, what happens like do yeah. does this become like constraining would it skew your results in in the direction of making the real universe look like Simba in any sense yeah that's that's a good question so so the 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 continuity model that was actually the the parameters that describe that were actually tuned from the illustrious simulation. Mm -hmm. um, and actually the work that you've done has shown, I think that Simba is a bit more bursty than mm -hmm. illustrious. So yeah, um, when we used the continuity model, which Joel had said, hey, this works reasonably well for our observed galaxies. Um, mm -hmm. It's a bit surprising that it doesn't work as well for Simba. And we said, yeah, that's kind of weird. But now we know that Simba, the, the galaxies in Simba tend not to be, or tend to be a bit more bursty. And so they're not fit well by continuity. So then, um, yeah, if, if we are, it could be that we are trying to squeeze Simba into a box that doesn't quite fit. Um, okay. Sounds good. Uh, Eric. Yeah, so since we're on screen and I realize that this assembled set of people is a little bit like Comic Con and that no question about star formation histories is too geeky, probably. I just wanted to ask about the idea of mass weighted age here. Yeah. Uh, have you thought about using something like T50, that is the age back to the median star rather than weighting by anything? And do you have arguments for and against? Um, I. I don't think I have any for or against because I don't think I'm well versed enough to hold any strong opinions about that. But um, to me, intuitively, quantities like T50 make much more sense. Um, it took me a while to grasp really what mass weighted or even light weighted age is, right? Um, so yeah, I, th I think if you were implementing a star formation history model that depends on some age parameter. It's, it makes much more sense to use mm -hmm. time at which X amount of mass was formed. Because that actually has a physical meaning. Yeah. So yeah, I, I always had trouble figuring out what these weightings really meant. You can eventually write down the equation, but I find the percentiles like T50 much simpler. And I think they work well when we're reconstructing star formation histories, not trying to exactly. use the word age and then turn it into something actually measurable by adding some weighting, which I think is the history of mass weighted age. Well, exactly, because you ask the question, you know, what's the age of this galaxy? And then what yeah. does that mean? <laughs> yeah. 
right perfect so we are on the hour thank you everyone All for right. attending and thank you sydney for this wonderful talk yes thank you for having me yep our pleasure right um if there are any questions uh if if people can send it to me i can forward them to sydney and uh, we will put the recorded talk up soon all right perfect all right thanks everyone right. have a great yeah. day thank you